Soft tissue sarcomas are a very rare group of tumors. So as a group of diseases, the annual incidence appears to be about 12,300 cases. And when you compare it to the common epithelial tumors like breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, the incidences are more than tenfold different. This is made even more complex by the fact that it's not one disease, it's a group of diseases and there may be, depending on how much of a stickler for details we get, there could be 50 plus subtypes, 70 plus subtypes of soft tissue sarcomas. Now luckily in the clinics there are a few that we encounter far more commonly than others. The top three soft tissue sarcoma histologies would be liposarcomas, leiomyosarcomas, and what is now called undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, what in the older days used to be called malignant fibrous histiocytoma. And then there's a smattering of several other different histologies that will happen with variable frequencies. Uh, in terms of, of incidence uh, and the distribution in terms of age limit, this is an interesting disease that spans the pediatric age group all the way to octogenarians and nanogenarians, if you will. So young children develop these same these diseases, older people develop the diseases, and there may be some histologic predilection for it. For example, the pediatric soft tissue sarcomas tend to be more the osteosarcomas, Ewing sarcomas, rhabdomyosarcomas, and an occasional synovial sarcoma, alveolar soft part sarcoma, as opposed to the adult population where we talked about liposarcomas, leiomyosarcomas, and the undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas. But within soft tissue sarcomas, there is a broad way of classifying this or subcategorizing them, and that is about 60 to 65 percent of all soft tissue sarcomas will arise in the extremities. Within extremities, lower extremities, more common than upper extremity. That leaves you with the remainder where about so uh, up to 30 ish percent of them will arise in the trunk and the intra-abdominal, what we call retroperitoneal locations. And that leaves you with approximately 10%, give or take a few here or there, that would arise in the head and neck area or arising from visceral organs. So that's the broad way of sort of distinguishing uh, or, or subcategorizing where these originate from. Uh, and the implication of this is in terms of biology, implication in terms of surgical abilities and how well can the surgeons get around it. Uh, and to a certain extent from a clinical behavior standpoint, the metastatic pattern may also be uh, somewhat driven by the anatomic location. For example, a generic comment that gets made always is, that sarcomas have a predilection to spread to the lungs. They are a lung dominant metastatic pattern and that's a true statement. The exceptions would be some of the intra-abdominal sarcomas given their location and how the venous drainage works out. Liver metastases may be far more common in an intra-abdominal sarcoma than it would be in an extremity sarcoma for example. So there can be some specific clinical behavior issues that may relate to the actual site of, of, of origin. The location of the tumor also has some bearing in terms of when the patient presents to the physicians. I think clearly if there was a growing lump on the back of someone's hand or on their leg, they're far more likely to pick it up early. That draws their attention. They may go to the primary care physicians, get it worked up, and you may pick up an extremity sarcoma earlier then a typical intra-abdominal primary tumor, by virtue of its anatomic location, the tumor has plenty of room to grow until it gets big enough to put some pressure on the surrounding visceral organs or nerve plexuses to create some symptoms. So as a general rule, it wouldn't be uh, uh, un unheard of for the intra-abdominal sarcomas to be routinely large whereas extremity sarcomas can span from small to large depending on the location and how quickly could the patient have, have uh, perceived it and figured it out.